Hi, this is Caroline Hamilton. I'm going to be your presenter today. We're going to be talking about how, how to prevent active shooters. We're getting it down to a science, and I'm proud that everybody that I've ever worked with has never had, never ever had an incident after they learned the secret to this, which is to keep certain elements out of the equation, and that's when we'll be talking about that. So I've been working in this field for probably 30 years now, ever since I came to Washington, D.C. to help the FBI in California, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, they, they, because I had a background in risk assessment. So somebody told them about me and what I was doing. And they said, okay, come out and help us relocate the old uh, FBI criminal justice system that used to be in the old J. Edgar Hoover building in downtown Washington and relocate it to West Virginia. So I did that. <coughs> then I helped patent and trademark. Patent and trademarks take care of all their old patents. Hang on, I'm just going to get a little sip of water here. So this is my background. Now I work all over the world. <coughs> Of course, got COVID, I've been here mostly for the last uh, couple of years. And there are a couple of things that I want to talk about this time. Of course, we have the Valdi shooting. I want to talk about what went wrong there, what the lessons learned were, and the fact that guns are now the number one leading cause of death among children for 2020. And this is something that came out with the governor in Texas, said a, a law, had a 60-minute news conference right at the day after the shooting and said that, you know, he had passed this 2019 law that allowed districts to harden their schools from external threat after the shooting in the art classroom in Santa Fe High School near Houston and after the Uvalde gunman was able to enter Rob's elementary school through a back door that we and people were calling again to harden the school so what happens is they something terrible happens they give money for it and then they forget all about it and until it happens again and then they go back and check and nothing's been done so again one thing that I want to talk about in 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 stress in this presentation is that we're not dealing with the old days where that's going to just get, uh, you know, pushed off. Instead, they're getting these billion dollar lawsuits. Now, that's a new thing. $27 billion class action lawsuit was filed a week after the, the May 24th shooting at Robb Elementary. It left 19 students and two teachers dead. A group of, of, of attorneys actually served the school district at their school board district meeting with a notice of claim. And on the Monday after that, said Uvalde, CISD, and its police department failed to implement their active shooter plan, failed to exercise command and control of law enforcement who responded to this tragedy. We want this amount of money to compensate these people for this wrong that was parachuted on them. He also said he hopes a large sum can fund mental health resources for everyone in the school, hold police forces accountable. The lawsuit will be formally filed this month, and it named a long list of defendants because there were 386 law enforcement personnel on the ground outside the classrooms who never went in. So we're just going to step back a little and look at some of the active shooter statistics from the last year. So this is what happened in 2021 and 2020. So in 2020, we had 40 incidents in 19 states. In 2021, we had 61 incidents in 30 states. In uh, 2020, we had 164 casualties, and those 38 were killed. In 2021, we had 243 casualties, of which 103 were killed. We had only one law enforcement officer killed in 2020, two in 2021. We had 11 uh, law enforcement officers wounded in 2020, and only five in 2021. We met the 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 mass shooting definition in uh, five of the incidents in 2020 and in 12 and 2021. We had uh, eight incidents in 2020 where law enforcement engaged the shooters. We had 17 in 2021. And again, they were mostly male, 42 in 2020, 61. We still had the shooters. Some of them committed suicide. I did my own study on it. It turns out the, the line of demarcation is about 55 to 60. If you're over 55 to 60, you tend to fight to the death and, and not give up or surrender. In seven of the cases in 2020, 11, and 2021, younger people, they do not, they don't uh, commit suicide. They turn themselves in. And so here's a question from my audience. How come after every school shooting, gun control, and anti-gun legislations never address the fact that a gun law schools or gun free zones has been violated and per and failed to prevent the shooter from activating. I'll be happy to tell you why that is, is because they pass, as you'll see my bias, they pass these laws to do all sorts of things. They pass laws saying that the, the new law for the last 12 years has been that if there's an active shooter and you're a law enforcement, you run into the facility and you take out the shooter. That's the law. What happens? People go and they they don't want to go in. Just what happened in Uvalde, what happened in Sandy Hook, 
what happened up here in Parkland, which I live half a mile from, and they don't do what they said they would do. They sign up, they get the money, they're never held accountable for anything. It's just like the teachers who prop the doors open, and every one of these people comes through a propped open door, and they don't do anything about it. In fact, in Parkland, the school resource officer who hid under the stairwell, which we wouldn't have known if we didn't have a camera on, on the stairwell, the day after the shooting, he knew he was wrong. He, he allowed all those 34 people, 17 to be killed and 17 to be injured. And he went and applied for his retirement the very next day. So, I mean, it, it's not about the guns. This has nothing to do with guns. It has to do with holding people accountable for their actions. And like a judge said in one of these big cases where they got a $7 billion settlement, if you say you're a security resource officer, you actually have to act like a security resource officer. We had other ones in Philadelphia who hid in the cast iron boiler room. The whole security team didn't say that this lady was walking back in with her Glock after being fired and she was going to shoot, kill three people. They went and hid. They didn't call craft. They didn't tell anybody. They didn't warn anybody. They just left. So, uh, you know, it's it's a moral thing, a, a moral failing, I think, that it, it's, again, it's a rule of law. If people do not, in saying gun-free zones, you know, that that and a quarter buy a cup of coffee, or, or a dollar fifty buy you a cup of coffee, but, you know, they don't have, they don't have the required uh, decals on the door saying this is a gun-free zone. They don't have uh, a, a container there with a top. We have people who, they use like containers, like you, like a moving box, plastic, cut the top out, say, please deposit your weapons here. End of the day, there's nothing. Put in the metal detection and goes through the scanner. If 200, 200 guns went through the hospital that day. So that's a that's the kind of thing we're up against. I hope that answers your question. You can also write me and we'll cont continue the dialogue online. School shootings, just I'm sure this won't be a surprise to you, like every other shoot, have just hit the highest level on record according to federal data. So this was a new report that just came out in June from the education department. It shows that there were 93 school shootings during the last school year. And increased by 11 from a decade ago. And uh, this was during the 2021 school year, that same year we were just talking about with the other. It's a new report just published. And uh, 43 of those 93 school shooting deaths resulted shootings resulted in death and they said that the rate for 12 to 18 year olds was lower than 2019. There were still more sh shootings with casualty in 2021 than any other year since data collection began in about 2003. And she also analyzed data collected on criminal victimization experienced by students, discipline, security practices at K-12 through schools, the mental health things that they required, and everything else. Major, uh, The major who's with us with this title in the thing says, I agree with you 100%. I've been advocating accountability for one's position, but I have been addressing demographic that feels like gun legislation will prevent incident. Yes, I th think gun legislation will prevent incidents. And I also think, and I think like any normal person would think that allowing an 18 year old to buy an assault rifle, but not buy a handgun is ridiculous. I mean, what kind of a law is that? It's just like, it's, ter it's just everything about it's terrible. So that again, have to get through the election, have to get back to, you know, people who care about other people, you know, so that we can, uh, we can do things that protect people. And that's just all I want to do is just do things that protect people. So now let's talk about what happened in Uvalde, because I have the I have the book right here for you to look at. And why do these things? The th here's the thing that I knew exactly where I was when Columbine happened. I was upstairs, I was changing the sheets on the guest bedroom, they were pink. I remember holding them in my hand the moment I saw on TV that these kids had gone in and shot that school up. And I thought, Oh, shit, you know, the, uh, excuse my French. That was really bad. And I, on these things, when these things happen, I find out about them. I remember them forever. Like I can see the, the wallpaper color, you know? And why is it still happening? Because security's still an afterthought. Even if it's a requirement, they don't follow it. And there's no accountability for not following it. Security is still an expense item on a balance sheet. So what happens? The CEO, CFO gets it. He gets a budget for next year. He takes out all the all the expense items and th that aren't critical, like gas, like uh, heat in the winter. And the other problem I see is that security doesn't have its own model. It's still following this law enforcement model that you catch the person who did it and you turn them over to the justice system and they take care of it. And, and corporate security is not like that. School security is not like that. And I have a friend, Michael D'Angelo. If you want to look up it, he wrote a really good book about making that transition from law enforcement to security. And it's, it's a complete different thing. So, and again, there's all these products now for facilities that are so technical and so good. In fact, I started, I've been an IT person 
my whole life, I started my first job was in IT for the federal government, so for the FBI. So in, in the tech is embedded in physical and security products, but people don't know how to use it. So this is a guy who lost his uh, daughter. There's her picture. And here he's holding the report that we're going to be going through and looking at. Here's a report. It came out on July 17th, and it's an interim report, investigative committee. Here's a link to it. So if you're in a school, I would recommend that you, when I send you these slides, that you cut this part out or, or just cut and paste it and send it out to everybody in the school and say, I think in management, the teachers, security, school resource officer said, I, I think that everybody, I recommend everybody read this, read this book, read this 77 page report, a special notice to pages 70 to 77, because that's where all the solutions are. And so I think that's important to, for people to read this. I think it's important to have a dialogue about it. I think it's important in fact, I'm thinking of militarizing the PTA and some other mothers, mothers groups. And I have a whole lot of people who want to do that too. So here again, showing just some, just like, you know, every other year, June has the most active shooter incidents. This is a, an FBI survey that I showed you. It's not just schools, it's everything. This is what days of the week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Like, you know, why? Like, just no rhyme or reason for it. Where do they take everywhere? So in California, San Jose, Vegas, Illinois, Chicago, Baltimore, Atlanta, Lakeland, Florida. Again, the mass killing locations, number one. And there, again, there were 61 mass killings in 2021, six in California, five in Georgia and Texas, two incidents each in Alabama, Arizona, Illinois, Maryland. Here's how it's going up. So this is 2017, 18, 19. There's 20, 33% increase. In between 2020 and 2021, the ones I just read you, 50 two percent increase in the active shooter incident so how many school shootings have there been again terrifying to students reignite polarizing debates about gun rights and school safety and so they've been education week journalists started tracking this the shootings that happen on school property and in 22 they're 2022 they're continuing this 27 school shootings this year 119 school shootings since 2018 Highest number, 34, were last year in 2021. And there were 10 shootings in 2020. And I think that there are going to be more than that in 2022. And here's how to prevent the school shootings. So there is a way to do it, but nobody has the will to get it done. And because it's become so political, partly, I think, five solutions. And this is how I would, this is how I do it when I go out and help people. And in fact, if you want, I can come to your location for a day or even do it online and I can predict and show you exactly why you're, you're likely to have an active shooter event, what you would lose if you had it, and how much it would cost to prevent it. So number one to do is you have to do the risk assessment. It's a requirement of OSHA. It's a, a get a worksite assessment. It's required by every state. It's required by every city, county. It's required by every agency of federal government. You have to do an annual S security risk assessment. That's where it's going to tell you what the threats are. You're going to identify what the weaknesses are going to interview people and find out what they're doing and why they're doing it that way. So that's number one. And because every year, what we want to do is want to do this assessment. We take the results of the assessment and then we, we carry them out. We implement the things that need to be implemented. Next, number two is the full facility access controls. That's the second most important thing that we need. And we have to have these doors secured. We have to have these back doors, especially not propped open. It's a huge deal with any propped open doors. We have to put in these enforcing having a concealed weapons detection screening system in our lobbies all over the all over the country. Uh, we have to, it would be nice to have an armed officer in the lobby. This is like what things could prevent something from happening. These are the only things that are going to prevent an active shooter from happening where you are. And number five is a secure doors. Again, with again major for accountability. We have to have penalties if you don't do these things. I mean, it's just like a, a teenager. If you say, if you, if you don't, if you, you know, you should, you should be more law, you know, you should behave better or something. What are the metrics for that? You know, what do you mean by behave better? Somebody told me that one time I complained about my son not wanting to do the dishes. He said, you can, you can, you know, what, what's he doing? Is he running out? No, no. Well, what's he doing? He said, you can make him, you can give him that job and say he has to do it, but he doesn't have to like it. That's the thing. And really that applies to this too. The people have to do these things. I understand they don't like them. They don't like thinking about security. They don't like thinking about their kid dying. I understand that. 
but it's not worth it. Wait, the little inconvenience you're going to have by thinking about it for an hour outweigh is outweighed by the good that it's going to do by saving lives all over the country, all over the world. When to have the door security, when alarms on those doors, so it rings throughout the whole facility or puts in a flashing light. If one of those doors is open longer than however long it takes to get in, 10 seconds. And they want, we're going to have substantial penalties like a month without pay, three months without pay, if those doors are left open. So these are the kind of things that we think about as a control for an active shooter. And do you have access control on all of your doors? Do you have an area of refuge for people to go and hide that's a safe area with everything you need? And that also gets to the discussion about what happens when kids are shot and in a room and deserted like they were in Uvalde, where the police were actually maybe five feet away from the door and they wouldn't open the door. They assumed there were no children in that classroom. And actually two classrooms were full of children and they bled out on the floor because they didn't allow anybody to get to them. So we went bollards at the front entry so the cars can't try to drive right through the lobby. We went cameras to record everything that's going on. We went concealed weapon detection screening in the front lobby. So every single person has to get scanned. That's the only way that it works. If you do anything else, and no matter how much money you spend, you're never going to stop these weapons from coming in the school. And I'm not talking about just guns. I'm talking about knives and knives will never be banned. You know, you need them to cut bread, you know, yeah, disaster recovery plans. Great. Again, systems, notification, all this stuff is great, but it all kicks in after something horrible happens. So just once, just like in that movie Deja Vu, where I stole this line from Denzel Washington, my favorite movie in the world, you know, just for once, I'd like to do something and stop it before it happens, instead of always having to go in at the end and cleaning up after something else, after something horrible happens. Same thing with the emergency plan. I mean, there's no good in an emergency plan after the event has happened. Same thing, policies and procedures. This is the other problem, and I, I noticed it the first minute I heard the um, news that this had happened. It, it said that it had the it can't happen here attitude. The first thing they said was, "We are this is a wonderful school. We're such a close knit community." Remember, I'm saying that we're such a close knit, you know, a place. This could never happen here, you know. And they think that the administrators think that they think that in hospitals, they think that in schools, they think that in federal agencies, nothing ever could happen here. Look at the doors here; they're so secure. But again, if they don't do these things, then it can happen here, and it's going to happen there. And the fact that you think it's not just makes it more likely that it is going to happen. So again, there was no investigation into Ramos, the shooter here in Uvalde. There was no warning after he shot his grandmother in the face and stole her truck and drove off with it in front of neighbors standing out in front of their cars. And they didn't call police. They didn't call the school. They didn't. He, after he yelled out the window, I'm going to go kill kids at a school now. Nobody called the school. 17 neighbors standing out in the street did not call the school. They didn't call the police. They didn't call the sheriff. So, you know, nobody wants to do anything. Commander on the scene didn't get notified that the 911 calls were coming from inside the building. Kids had phones. They were calling dispatch and saying, my, my cousin's dying. She's right next to me. We're bleeding all over. And they never gave that information. The dispatcher didn't give the information to the commander, the incident commander. They didn't, they didn't allow the first responders in because they thought that you know, they weren't sure if the shooter was still in there. They didn't want to take a chance on getting hurt themselves. Not exactly the brave uh, first responder you think about. They wouldn't let them in. So they bled out on the floor. And in fact, in Parkland, the same thing happened. They bled out on the floor. And there's a three-story tower that I drive by about four times a day. And in that tower, it has, uh, it has blood. It has the backpacks of the kids. It has everything just in a time capsule. All they did was bring the bodies out, you know. And they, it's, that was four years ago, and they finally just got funding to knock that thing down, and nobody's ever going to have a class in there again, but it's still, they didn't even clean the blood stains, or st I, went, I got a secret tour in there, blood stains are still on the floor, just like it was when all those children died, no case management on the shooter, even though they knew he had problems, and no accountability, so just like everything else in life, you know, you eat pizza, you eat a whole pizza every night for dinner, there are consequences, you know, in fact, I saw an article today about a 20, 28 year old guy who was really an internet personality about all the stuff he did and pictures of him eating and all the stuff he died at 28. Pretty, pretty shocking.
choice or consequences. So again, what, what other factors are at work? Revenue problems initially. Uh, the, it can't happen here attitude. The not aware of the fines that you get. And, uh, you know, some of the ones like the Uvalde parents just filed that are like $25 million fine. The school's going to have to pay that school. We'll divide it up between the school board, the county, and the, uh, and the actual administration of the school. And a lot of these things, because of these new requirements, that allows these wrongful death lawsuits. These aren't a choice anymore. They have you have to do them. And again, let's so let's so a lot of people say, yeah, but what about the shooter? You know, I mean, he had an unstable home life, brought up in in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, didn't have good parenting figures, unstable housing conditions, and poverty. And uh, he legally purchased two assault rifles just before he turned eighteen. So here's the problem major in the laws is that he couldn't buy a gun till he was 18, but he could buy two AR style rifles before he was 18. You can also buy ammunition for your guns before you're 18. You can buy accessories, you can buy laser sights and all these things for your guns before you're 18. So that's what he did. He took his money and he bought all this, these different things. And here's the other thing that I was saying with the gun sales. Gun sales have to be reported to the back to ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. It wasn't reported. His gun purchases were not reported to law enforcement. Only handgun purchases are required to be reported to local police. If you have an 18-year-old on his birthday who goes in by two assault rifles, it's not reported. And no information that was known to local Uvalde law enforcement. This should have been identified this attacker as a threat to a school campus before the shooting began. A lack of leadership, despite they had 376 law enforcement officers at the scene. It was chaotic and uncoordinated. The, the, the incident commander did not know his job. The group of federal, state, and local officials lacked any leadership, no communication, and no urgency to take the gunman down. They were all afraid of getting hurt or having their friends hurt. Previous official accounts of the shooting placed preliminary brain on, blame on the school district's police commander, Pete Arredondo, who's now on administrative leave. He's, he had just been elected to city council. He's since resigned from that. He's been put on permanent leave, and there are other police, uh, five other people too, who are on, uh, who've been removed from service now. After he entered the school, Arredondo, he entered the school, he went to classroom 110, which had bullet holes, but there were no children inside. Afraid of what he'd find, he didn't go to rooms 111 and 112, where the gunman fired more than 100 rounds. He assumed, he said, that it was empty as well, which is just like the chicken, most chicken whatever chicken scratch of defense I've ever heard of. And of course they were, kids were in there getting shot, but he proceeded, he actually changed the official designation to one of a barricaded subject, not as an active shooter, according to the report. And the committee said, with the benefit of hindsight, we now know this was a terrible, tragic mistake. Officers said they knew the gunman was in one of the rooms, but they didn't know what was happening by the time the closed doors. Even though they heard gunshots, they didn't hear screams or cries. Relaxed school security that they'd always have because, da 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 say it for me. They were such a close-knit community and everybody loved each other. And because of that, it allowed the, the gunman to attack quickly and nobody even stopped him. Even though it had active shooter procedures, it had training, they had a culture of complacency around the measures. Out of convenience, some teachers frequently left doors unlocked or propped open, which was a violation of school policy. And during a shortage of, because there was a shortage of keys, substitute teachers were sent to be told to basically circumvent the locks, unlock the door, leave the doors unlocked. School was also set up with an intruder alert system, but there were so many false alarms that it, it didn't work. No, 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 no bailout alert had ever resulted in a violent incident, so people didn't pay any attention to them. On the day of the attack, the gunman scaled a five-foot-tall exterior fence before multiple unlocked doors allowed him to enter the classrooms unimpeded. And they said if the security... Let me get this to go away so I can read that. Uh, it could have been... A, it could have been... It, it was... It, he killed most of the victims before the first responders were even called. So, so again, I don't put my faith in and trusting humans are going to carry out the correct policy all the time. I mean, I understand people who are afraid, but it's no excuse if you're being, if they're being, they're being paid to be brave, you know, and that's what I would expect. Luckily, we have artificial intelligence, so we can't depend on those people anymore. I feel like that should be like a wake up call for everybody. So what we have is we have a concealed weapon detection screening system, and I have no interest in the company at all. It's a company like all the other companies, I know the people who work in all these companies, 
we get together at shows, we get together at incident meetings like NASRO and things like that. We, we give presentations like this one to people. And so we know each other. And so basically I, I found this company at a conference that I was at and I was so impressed with what they were doing. I got to know them better. And so I decided I would do webinars for them. And that's what I'm doing now because I think it's the only way out of this situation that we're in. Hospital schools, they don't do any screening. I, I was... And it's amazing because I go back and visit the people where they had the incidents a lot of times. Like I was at the Noblesville West uh, Middle School where they had a bad shooting in the classroom. A uh, guy went to kid, high school kid, went in, into his locker and told him he needed to get his inhaler. He went to the locker and got his gun instead. Man, his girlfriend came back, shot, shot the girlfriend twice. Science teacher jumped up, ran, ran in front of him to save the girl shot the science teacher five times in the stomach. And when I went out there a month later, they had barely cleaned the blood stains off the floor, but they couldn't afford to get, get, they weren't able to get the money from the budget to repair the holes in the walls where all the bullets went. So they bought a bookcase instead and he pulled the bookcase aside and showed me the bullets still wedged in the wall from it that they wouldn't pay to get fixed the wall. So we got to do something that doesn't take human intervention. So here we're going to show, if we have a system like this so we can show management what the return on investment is on weapon screening because it's not just that you're replacing the person who might have gotten killed you're getting sued these huge lawsuits crushing lawsuits by the parents and not only d disrupting the lives of every single person who goes to that school including the staff but it, you can make the money back easily of spending it not very expensive anyway you can get a free pilot program for months to check out and it also doesn't require you to have a security officer sitting there the whole time so again, we follow this Defense Department risk assessment methodology that we started in 1998. And that's why I came to uh, Washington, D.C. in 1990, but I'd never been, been all the way to Florida and back, but I'd never been to Washington, D.C. and Virginia and Maryland, where I ended up living for 15 years. So again, we devised this standard. I was on all these working groups for everything according to risk. And this standardized methodology, we decided to use as our target high value critical assets. So things that are ex expensive to replace, a high uh, replacement value, and also things that are critical to the functioning of the organization, like people, and something that's currently required by assessment. Every single federal agency, Homeland Security, the Defense Department, U.S. Federal Emergency Management, and the Defense Department all have this methodology in place. They do it every year, and I've worked on a working group committee to stop these kind of active shooter attacks for the Defense Department, the Northern Command. And we identified quite a few places like the dams in the world. So with my cocktail party question, how many dams are they in the United States? You would tell me 24, 64, something like that. 77,000 man-made and natural dams in the United States. And I wrote that methodology to do the risk assessments on all those dams before they had nothing. Same thing with FEMA. They have things that they've never assessed before. And now we're able to, uh, in fact, I even did a program for the Philadelphia Children's Hospital with Homeland Security funding to regulate better the amount of medicine children to avoid medication error in pediatric patients, basically. So this is a very well-known methodology. And we can also look at its return on investment. So what we want to do is figure out how much it costs to get, how much it costs to maintain over a year. I'm talking about the screening now and the value of that. Then we look at, because these are related, we look at how likely the threat is to occur. So what we want to do is we want to put something in place that's going to get you the most protection for the least amount of money. And that's what we do in our risk assessment. So it comes out with a list of recommendations based on return on investment or bang for the buck in this case. And we include all these different threat data things. We include the, the value of the assets, the, the financial value and the criticality value. Then we survey the staff to find the weaknesses we analyze all the controls that are in place and we test them to make sure that they work. And then we come out with our recommendations. And so these are all based, all the decisions we make for the next year are based on the, how we change the emergency plan, how we update it. If there's a, so half the country's in horrible flood, the other half's having wildfires. And those are all pre programmed out based on the results of the risk assessment. And we also re look at local crime rates, increasing all those things. And then how to warn the staff in case of an active shooter how to warn other local, state, and federal agencies and healthcare providers in the area. And these are the kind of lawsuits. So McDonald's lost a lawsuit for $27 million after two teenagers died in a fight in the parking lot next to the McDonald's. U.S. Security Associates, a lady was fired. She came back with her gun. The family sued for $64 million and they got it. The 
the security company had to merge in with somebody else. They lost the lawsuit. Stanford Health sued for $82 million after a lady in cardiac re rehab ran over the director of Lawrence Livermore Lab and lost the lawsuit. And Del Nor Hospital for nurses received a total of $8 million for being traumatized and raped by a patient. Six, we have uh, some active shooter incidents. I'm just, these are just some of the horrible ones that we've had lately. The 4th of July parade, nobody expected. The Oklahoma church, church the Alabama church shooting, the Tulsa, Oklahoma shooting, the Uvalde, of course, the top supermarket in Buffalo, Geneva church shooting, where the guy went to the church because he was Chinese and he hated Taiwanese. It was a Taiwan, little Taiwanese church in Orange County, California. He glued the door shut with super glue. Then he brought a loaded nail gun with him on the trip and he nailed the door shut. Then he put a padlock on the doors with a chain chain so it'd be impossible to open and then we have the oxford high school shooting we have the madison high school shooting just happened again but this was a bad five killed 16 injured at a shooting during the highland park fourth of july parade today she was 22 years old wrote poems about killing parents bought him two assault rifles for his birthday he entered through the roof through an unlocked back door of a eight-story building and he was able to get a high vantage point so he could shoot all these people charged with seven counts of murder in total there were seven shot and killed and 47 shot and injured i remember that day that just kept going up and up and up this is how we got our oldest active shooter on record 71 sat down with the church people at a dinner that they had and he never had been there before and uh, started shooting as soon as they killed three people the church. Here's the Geneva Presbyterian Church shooting, the Tulsa, Oklahoma shooting. This is a Tulsa shooting where they had a, it was a medical building inside of a, inside of a hospital campus, St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa. And he, he went up and shot the doctor who had operated on his back less than a month ago. And the same day he was released from the hospital, he purchased an AR style rifle. He already had a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson that had bought on May 29th from a pawn shop. Took him in, he killed the doctor, killed another doctor, killed a band bystander, and killed the receptionist. There's Encino Hospital again. Guy left his car running in the middle of the street with his, he had his dog with him, ran into the emergency room, stabbed a, a, a nurse and a paramedic, and almost killed them while they tried to negotiate with him. And he was they, they don't even know what his problem was. Again, pain medication problem. The nurse at Kaiser Permanente died by suicide, brought his gun to work. He No, no screening, so they didn't pick up the gun when he went to work. He just had his badge and went right through his shift. Halfway through his shift, he got up and shot himself in front of the patients and the doctors who were there in the emergency department. So it's not, it's the staff too. Everybody's bringing their guns to work. So it's a weather tech warehouse over a robbery, 27 year old uh, part time guy charged with, they attacked him for stealing from somebody and uh, he shot three. One of them died at a suburban warehouse and he was only a part time employee there. And again, the thing that we're dealing with here is this OSHA general duty clause that requires each employer to furnish to each of its employees a workplace free of recognized hazards that are caused are likely to cause death or serious harm. So we look at what it takes to prevent an active shooter. Five most controls, again, access, uh, access control to make sure those doors are locked, enforced entry, concealed weapons detection screening, the most current policies and procedures with accountability, secured doors and windows, and the security annual risk assessment. Again, these are required OSHA by man, mandated by OSHA, required by CMS for healthcare facilities. And the only way to do this is based on those current threat levels that we have. So if you have access control, you're going to have secure facilities. It's the number one element to keep these people out. All doors have to be locked on alarm. Camera systems should be set up to monitor the doors and people should look at them every day. In fact, I was at a hospital in Los Angeles last March. And I asked if I could go get a cup of coffee. And they said, oh, the cafeteria is closed. Why? We had a rat invasion because the cafeteria comes in early in the morning, like four o'clock in the morning to do the food prep for the day. And they leave the doors open and it's food. So all the rats go in there and they had one so bad they had to keep it closed for two weeks. In enforced entryway. There's got to be a place that you enter in. It's the only way to be sure there are no facilities. This could have prevented. These are all the, the shootings that happened where all these people died because they didn't have a, a single entryway and they didn't have the, the scanning software. And this is not like software that you see at the airport. This automatically reads you. So 4,000 people an hour can walk through them up uh, walk through these two columns. You can be listening to your iPod. You can have your phone in your pocket. You don't have to take off your shoes. And again, it could have prevented all these shootings if you just had that one piece of equipment. So again, most current policies and procedures, doors are never propped open and they're going to be accountability for all these things. Secured doors and windows, panic alarms available under counters and financial or work 
based penalties for propping the doors open, annual risk assessments, the uh, concealed weapon system, and then it goes around. So you identify the threats, you look at how much your assets are worth, you survey the staff, evaluate the state of all the different controls and how much protection they provide. So they have to have provide enough protection to protect the assets. And they're also based on the likelihood of the threat occurring. So you do that and then you, you go through the things we already did that. And then you we get information from all these different documents that we maintain, all this threat data. And then we average the threats together. And so this particular system that's so inexpensive, I was talking about entryway, it's probably an eighth of the budget for a year. And what is it? It integrates with RFID so it knows who's coming through. It maintains the highest possible traffic flow. It, you can open or lock the doors instantly if if it alarms to a weapon you can immediately lock them it's like a, have a man trap you can view it all on your phone if from anywhere and again it doesn't you don't need to take out anything you don't have to take your belt off you don't have to take your shoes off you, you can you don't need to take your cell phone out or keys or watches because only going to alarm on things that have a, a, a metallurgical uh, profile certain kinds of combinations of metals it detects from the air and this is what it looks like so it's just two pillars right here portable and one little computer screen and from here, it collects all the data, it transmits it over to here, and it three to 4,000 people an hour, and it detects more concealed weapons in any screening system. And you can even have a pilot, a three or four, six-month pilot, if you want, try it out. And when Cleveland Clinic tried this in, uh, in their three northern Ohio hospitals, within one month, they had found 30,000 guns and knives. They were going into the hospital every single day. They never would have known that if they weren't using this kind of a system. So again, we go through a little Look at all the different controls we have, and then we can come up with controls by return on investment, by cost-benefit analysis. Bottom line, you need to reduce the liability and prevent these school shootings before they happen. You need to go and talk to management about why you need to secure your facility, and if you need to call me and talk to me about it, I'll give you some good reasons. Lack of security is not an effective legal defense after an active shooter, so you have to analyze the access control. You have to look at putting in a concealed weapons screening system, and you have to do the risk assessment by performing the integrated security risk assessment. It allows us to gather the data to use for you to get the best bang for your buck. And if you're interested, you can write me for more details, more information. Here's my email address, caroline at riskandsecurityllc.com. And Michael Green, I again, this is not a company that I work for, and I don't own any stock in it or anything, but michael at athena-security.com. And uh, we also have other webinars there in the past webinars. If you want to go look at some of those, that's a good thing to do too. And I'm right here in Parkland, Florida, waiting for them to knock that building down. And I want to thank you tremendously for being here. I'm part of the thing today. So again, thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day tomorrow, a wonderful weekend. Feel free to write me, call me, and uh, we want to keep your schools safe too. I want to, it's, it's our mission in life. We want to save lives and I 100% agree that we could do it and it's going to be less expensive than what we're doing now. So have a good one and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.